so thanks very much for speaking to us oh um, my pleasure and i'm just in the middle of well I've just i've just finished uh season one of condor okay still recovering slightly from it yeah a lot of death a lot of death a lot of death i love a bit of death though uh on screen yes yes um but firstly i I have to do obligatory lockdown questions yeah go on everyone so how how has it been for you have you been active and creative and doing lots of things or has it been kind of a bit more of a sit on the sofa watching tv experience put it this way i remember that that thing at the beginning of lockdown when everyone was like oh this is your golden opportunity to learn to speak german or something <laughs> i i wasn't one of those people um but to be honest I, i'm a cyclist i've been doing a lot of cycling it's been a great time for that which has been nice it's been a good way to get out for me but it's funny you know as an actor you're all, always sort of worrying in the back of your mind and in front of your mind some days about when your next job is coming or, or where it's coming from or looking who's been cast in a part that you would have rather liked and yeah. you know there's always that sort of residual stress um but lockdown's been rather good in in so far as no one's doing anything and it's not right. anyone's fault yeah so i quite enjoyed that just yeah. for a few months not having to worry about work at all yeah uh, and focus on the sort of simpler things and you know yeah. yeah so it's been all right yeah have you been kind of taking stock of your career or anything like that you know thinking about what you're going to be doing next what you'd like to do has it been you know a reflective thing in that sense i i don't know i i, I probably imagine this isn't you know the smartest approach but i don't tr- i try not to linger on the past or, or worry too much about the future because mm. you know for the most part it's it's out of my control um and you know it's easy to go down that path uh and 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 you try to manufacture your own future but again it's sort of it's for me personally more stressful than anything else uh so no i've just been putting work to the back of my mind for the time being yeah yeah so um what happened with um when condor landed on your plate that must have been one of those great moments um what like how did how did it actually come about like how did you kind of land the role Oh, uh, in the normal way, really. I, yeah. I got an audition. Uh, they, they don't send you many episodes, I think. In fact, I, I didn't get an entire episode. I got bits and pieces. But yeah. I watched the original film again. Uh, yeah. And then, you know, you do these auditions, you send them off, and you forget about them. And, and, and then a couple, I was filming a, a film called The Wife at the time, and I was up in Glasgow, and then I got an email saying they really liked you. They'd like you to fly over for a, for a chemistry read. So I did that and, and it went well. Uh, and I met the writers when, when I flew out that time, um, which is good because shows like this in, I think 24 is a useful comparison. Um, yeah. Often, 24 is sort of to me, like slightly embodies the spirit of, of for instance, the Patriot Act, you know, quite an aggressive uh, stance towards terrorism and, and, and not much, investigating the broader picture you know far more reactive you know find the terrorists kill them lock them up bish bash bosh that's the end of the story so when i met these guys because you sign these five-year contracts so you sort of want to get a sense from them where's this going is this going to be something that i'm going to be embarrassed to be associated with uh, you know and its values Is is it going to go down that same kicking doors open and busting bad guys yeah. Uh, yeah, you know that direction. But what I like about Condor is is that they are it, it's it's sort of morally a little up for grabs. And mm-hmm. Joe, the character I played, you know, you meet him as an idealist, a bit of you know, a bit naive, and and he's wrestling with a lot of things that I think a- a- everyday people are wrestling with when when they when they look at government bodies like the CIA or the NSA or, or, or the institutions that prop up our way of life. Yeah. Um, and, and Joe asks himself those questions by extension, so do the audience. Uh, so that was nice meeting them and, and getting a sense of that was the direction they were going to go. Yeah. Um, and at that point I was, I was pretty good to do it. Yeah. Um, could you give us a brief introduction just because some people won't have, have seen yeah. it. 
Um, just an overview, it's difficult talking about these shows, isn't it, with the spoiler issues, but can you just give us a broad kind of intro, I think, from sort of season one? God, I'm, I, I must confess, I'm really bad at doing this. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm way, way too solipsist. I, I see it all from my perspective. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> God. Um, can we come back to this? Because my mind is, of course, right on cue. I'm completely blank. Of course. But, the, but you did have, like, really interesting source material. I mean, the, the original film, Three Days of the Condor, is one of those absolute classics. And came at that... It's quite interesting. It came at that time in the seventies, I think post Nixon, where there's yeah. a number of those kind of conspiracy. And it came out uh, just post post Watergate, you know. Right. Yeah. So there's all this intrigue, and then again, it seems like now is a another interesting time where there's a lot of um, corruption and collusion and all these kind of issues. A very murky world it feels at the top. Um, so did you have a sense of of that somehow of of, of tapping into? perhaps some of the paranoia and, and intrigue that's going on, you know, at the top level in society at the moment. Yeah, I think so. Um, I mean, the, our writers, they didn't try to keep on top of actual current affairs. You know, no. they, our show is set in a sort of parallel universe where Trump hasn't been elected, but the same forces are at work. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. You know, I think, as you say, people inherently sense this corruption and these, you know, the, a double standard of justice, depending on who you are and where you're from. Mm. Uh, and, and also, you know, you look at a hit, the history of the CIA, you look at their involvement in, in, you know, Africa, North and West Africa, you look at South America and this stuff, you know, isn't classified now. We can, we can see what the CIA were doing down there and mm. it's morally questionable. For the most part, and th those those things that the CIA were up to are the things that have sort of enabled us to have, you know, fresh avocados year round, or, or cheap and plent plentiful gasoline in our cars, or cell phones that can do extraordinary things, or all these sort of m mod cons that we now live with are off the back of a lot of this, you know, clandestine activity, and and you know we we look the other way with regards to these things um i know i'm not really answering your question here no, uh, no. and and that's sort of what i like is that I, th I think people need to be reminded of you know when you have a cell phone with all these apps that know all your locations and they they take your metadata and they analyze it and they 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 they, they you know they offer a service uh you're as as we're learning now you're giving you're hemorrhaging your private data so there's a hidden cost um and you're enabling organizations that shouldn't necessarily be enabled and there's a hidden cost and there's a hidden cost to an enormous amount of things we do in in the west and particularly in in, in north america yeah. uh so yeah that was the angle that piqued my interest most um mm. And that's, I think, what our show centers around, as opposed to the upper echelons of actual government. It's more the sort of murky, not quite so uh, documented, clandestine side of the government. Yeah, um, yeah. But it certainly taps into people's very natural suspicions and, and uh, worries that people are having now. Yeah. And it's quite interesting, the, um, you know, the depiction of, of morality and trying to do the right thing. Mm. Uh, in such a difficult, complicated world. I mean, Joe, the character, finds that quite difficult in, in, in many ways. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not an easy, it's not an easy, straightforward uh, action here. It's not Jack Bauer, as you said. Yeah. Uh, he's, you know, he's entangled. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and also, you know, the nature of these decisions is sort of super nebulous and, and, and the ramifications for a decision either way, you know, they, they, have knock-on effects and vibrations and all sorts of directions it's it's not as simple when you're you know operating with organizations this large you know with many motivations it's not as it's not a binary thing yes or no good or bad it's it's you're always operating in that murky gray area yeah. uh and i think we we as the audience go with joe in that in that uh you know in 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 that sort of you know the 
depth of his naivety and and and, and mm. the understanding of that reality. Yeah. He's a good character as well because uh, you know we look a lot at um, masculinity on our site, and um, you know he's he's um, you know he's quite vulnerable as a character. Yeah. He's afraid a lot of the mm-hmm. time. Um, was that interesting to play? That, that you know looking at all these different aspects and and not having someone who is yeah your standard sort of hero, I guess. Oh, far more interesting. You know he's he's three dimensional sort of psychologically, and far more always far more interesting. Uh, and I think it, it it is that vulnerability and that sensitivity and that that constant questioning um, that makes him appealing and makes him effective. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, that a lot of people say these days, you hear people say, oh, you're thinking too much. I, I don't know if you can think too much. I think you can think in the wrong way. You can have like bad patterns of thought, mm. you know, unhelpful self-hating patterns of thought and that's bad but generally thinking and analyzing and looking at your emotions and and you know ethically questioning what you're doing is broadly a good thing no matter what i, I would argue yeah yeah for sure um i mean he is he's kind of like a, a you know a laptop hero yeah uh, but you do get to do um lots of action stuff as well do you um was that was that good fun did you have to do any kind of skills training for for any of that stuff it, it, the action stuff is good fun and you know I'd be lying if I said it, it you know it was difficult it you know it's just fun you get to you know I'm 35 now and I get to get all that childish stuff uh, out and, and use it a bit um, in terms of skills and that sort of thing I had to learn weaponry you know I had to learn how to handle a gun uh, which I, I really didn't enjoy I sort of expected to uh, mm. And then I got, we, I went to the shooting range and there was this enormous uh, man. He, you know, his, I remember his skin was so leathered. He just looked like he'd, he'd lived the life. And his neck was so thick and he had a shaved head. And he was in, he was in SWAT and he had been special forces. Right. And, I, and I went into this room and he, he just gave me this uh, M4 uh, <laughs> machine gun. An actual M4, and the entire room was covered, every square inch of wall was covered with you know, your various machine guns from like bazookas all the way down to like, you know, PP9s. And he handed me this gun like it was the most natural thing on earth. And I just started sweating and shaking. <laughs> yeah. I hated it. I felt so British and pale and just unde- not designed for it. Yeah, yeah. But fortunately, Joe's character isn't sort of, he's not a natural born killer. He's, he's not kinetically trained really as you say he's more of a keyboard keyboard warrior yeah. so it, it rather fit that, that that i felt uncomfortable yeah but yeah. other than that as you say lots of running and hiding and you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah I've, I've i've shot a gun once in vegas many years ago which was just a terrible thing and every time i shot i kind of jumped <laughs> and it's kind of, I, was, I knew I was doing it and I was still scaring myself. It was yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, yeah, for English guys, it's not. It's not we enough. don't need them. We don't need no. them. Fine. It's all up here. Um, do you, um, when you're doing a show kind of about the CIA or, CIA or anything, do you have any kind of interference? I mean, this might be taking it too far and they don't really care. But, yeah. I mean, do you have, do you, you know, does anyone you know at that level show an interest or you know how does that work how no does it um i as far as i mean it's a bit above my pay grade but yeah I, I i i don't think so we did have a guy who came to set to uh to sort of check that what we were doing was vaguely authentic okay um and he was again you one of these people you could just tell a, a, frankly you know dumb people in you could just tell <laughs> he had that weight to him um and he was, he was, I can't remember the title he had, but he, he basically ran the Northern African uh, wing of the CIA. Right. And then he also was very active in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. Mm-hmm. Um, and I spoke to him about Putin, because I, I find Putin to be pretty much the most fascinating person on planet Earth. And I spoke to him and he told me loads of interesting things, none of which I can now remember, which is great. <laughs> um, but he was, as, as far as sort of an oversight, uh, he was the only thing we had, but I did read the other day that you know those movies they're like i don 't know the Transformers movies, for instance, where they have all this military gear and hardware yeah 
apparently the, the military give huge, huge tax breaks for films and, and, and shows that, that paint them in a good light uh, and, and sort of advertise their military tech. Um, so I, I think it's all part of the, you know, the psychological spin right. thing they do. Yeah, sure, let's glamorize the CIA and let's imply that their, the NSA's reach is global and constant and... I see. So I, I remember Ed wrong. Edward Snowden, who was a bit of a case study for me in this part, he said something like, uh, you know, for years the NSA weren't capable technologically of the things we suspected they were sort of eavesdropping on all forms of electronic communication. They now are, but they weren't. But the fact that people believed they were uh, was massively important to the CIA. So I, I think as long as that, you know, we're towing the line, mm. they're happy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, Transformers is an advert for the military. Yeah, but I think there are a lot of films like that. The next yeah. time you watch a film and you see, you know, <laughs> fighter jets and, you know, stealth bombers and all this high-end tech, yeah who's who's benefiting from that the, the, you know the military <laughs> yeah um so edward snowden was a was a someone that you looked at was was the was it for the role yeah partly because he you know he he, he was a keyboard you know uh keyboard yeah. warrior but also he you know he's got that moral and ethical dilemma yeah uh, with what he's doing um i think slightly comparable to to joe uh yeah. He was, um, you know, partly responsible for, for coming up with this technology, but then had an issue with how it was being used against against uh, American citizens and citizens around the world uh, mm. without warrants or oversight or regulation, um, which is kind of similar to Joe. Yeah, yeah. Um, so can you just bring us up to season two? Because it's, yeah, it's a weird way that's fallen, but it's kind of, it's been released on Sky. So. Yeah weekly now so um obviously we can't give anything away on season one but where's where's joe when we meet him in season two he's sort of on the run yeah. uh, on the run from the cia on the run from his own conscience uh yeah you know on the run to avoid putting his friends and family in danger yeah. and and at the beginning of season two he's hopping from city to city to city staying no more than a couple of weeks in each place and, and trying not to make any relationships but, you know, he's a human after all, and, and those things begin to happen. Mm. And then he finds himself being pulled back into the agency. Yeah. Um, you know, different threats are presenting themselves. Russia are now involved, of yeah. course. Uh, yeah. But, so, yeah, he's back, he's back in. But he's, he is slightly, he, he's hardened by the events of, yeah. of season one. And that, that naivety, I think, is gone from him. Mm, for sure. Um, now, also in the show, you get to work with some incredible actors. Mm. Um, uh, William Hurt kind of is a sort of standout for me. Um, yeah, me too. In terms of um, Altered States was like my big film that I used to really love when I was a kid. Um, what's, what, yeah, what, was it, what was it like working with him? Because he's got such an interesting career where he's kind of like, he's leading man, but also character actor. He's had a really interesting yeah. sort of, you know, um, yeah, he's had an interesting career i guess so what what's he what's he like and and do you when you're working with people like that are you picking stuff up from them or, or you know what? so william like I, it's, it's actually the second time i've worked with him i did a, a film uh, called the host years ago with him um and you know i'll be honest with you he's terrifying he's a terrifying <laughs> human being he's he's just one of those people who who uh who has a lot of weight to them and is not afraid to, to use it to make his point. And I rather like that, you know, there, there can be a preciousness on set. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I, I don't want to interfere with your process and all that sort of thing. And, and you do you and I'll do me and hopefully, which mm. while well-meaning can be a slow, ineffective, frustrating, boring way of doing things. Right. Whereas Will, William Hurt, it, you know, he is like a bull in a china shop. Yeah. And the first time, in the, uh, I worked with him in the host. We actually had a huge argument. Right. Um, he came to set one day and he was in a bit of a bad mood for, for a good reason uh, with the production as a whole. And it was a scene with, with lots of young actors and he was just throwing his weight around a bit uh, to the point that something had to be said. And for better or for worse, I went up to him afterwards um, and we had a bit of an argument. 
and it but but out of it it didn't last long five minutes and then out of it was born a real a real sort of mutual uh i guess working respect um Mm. and that was great because i wasn't scared of him anymore he and he you know he's a very effective actor he's he's relentless in his pursuit of the, the sort of truth of the scene and he's not afraid to roll his sleeves up and that is i think pretty useful for a young actor like myself or anyone else to to witness yeah um so yeah he's fantastic and boy he's got charisma jesus christ on camera <laughs> he's he's something else yeah he's one of those actors who can be terrifying but also heartbreaking at exactly the same time yeah 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 he's got one of those faces and also like he did a film that i really love it's called too big to fail on on hbo uh and it was about the banking crisis um and uh when he got to set to film that i don't know if you've seen it but it's got an amazing cast it's really worth a look uh he got to set and he realized that all the actors didn't understand the financial system you know a famously complex and and hard to penetrate system Mm. um and he you know he was playing hank paulson the the treasury secretary and 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 then all the other people were playing heads of banks and all this sort of thing and he insisted he said listen we we've got to get our head around this to make this authentic and he forced the hands of the producers into slowing down shooting and adding two weeks of research rehearsal and that i mean it must have been a pain in the ass for the producers but for us that's fantastic yeah because a lot of tv now you know it's cranked out so quickly you've got to do it so fast to get it up on netflix and to have an actor who uses his weight to 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 do that is is great yeah yeah it's interesting isn't it um and i guess you know you do you do hear of of some actors who do kind of take charge of productions like that i mean obviously the it's usually you know very well established sort of dudes but i mean do you kind of still have that responsibility you know you're in front of the camera but you know at the same time you know you, you have to be very giving there's a lot of people who are involved in the production but I mean what, what kind of responsibility do you sort of feel to everything in that sense uh, you know and, and I suppose it's beyond just sort of tweaking the odd line yeah uh, you know do you do you so I guess what I'm asking is do you feel like you have to be a leader on set do you feel that kind of responsibility to be honest with you mm. yes Mm. um for a few different reasons as you sort of mentioned you know you've got to be a fairly high, high up the call sheet uh mm. to be able to get away with that and there are a lot of people you know i've done shows over the you know in my time where young girls out of drama school first job um there is one production i'm thinking of but i probably shouldn't say it uh they she gets set and she's asked to take her shirt off you know and mm. You know that's not a good environment so you've, you've got to sort of stand up in that way mm. but also in, in, from a more selfish point of view uh it's it's you on the screen you know yeah. it's you on the screen and once it finishes you're still it's still on the internet you know there's a real permanency to it mm. um and you know while everyone does have a part to play in a production and you know every every role is essential you're the one on the screen and 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 unfortunately especially in television the director might not necessarily be remembered uh but the actors will so you you've got to you've got to fight those um battles Mm. knowing when to acquiesce is is important knowing when you're wrong is important Mm. uh and knowing how to do conflict is important Mm. that's something personally that i've always struggled with like uh you know you don't want to scorch the earth no and i'm learning in life more and more that you can win an argument but it doesn't necessarily mean you win long term right you know you can you yeah. can win an argument but blow a relationship right uh, so it's 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 about doing it the right way i find mm. yeah yeah um in terms of uh uh mental health and some of the pressures on uh being an actor um how do you experience sort of you know uh any pressures that you you find difficult to handle i mean i suppose from an outsider the uh, life of an actor seems quite stressful anyway because you're going from role to role i guess you're auditioning a lot and facing rejection and things like that so having to you know kind of get your head around 
you know the job as, as a whole in in that regard um yeah so i mean how do you kind of uh, uh, manage the 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 um you know the life of an actor and and how do you, and, and what kind of pressures have you faced personally well it's a really good question that um quite a, quite a lot of pressures uh there's a few few little things i'll say about that you know one what i see with a lot of people and i certainly had it at the beginning of my career was was thinking that your worth as an actor equated your worth as a human. Um, and you do face rejection. You face rejection for so many reasons, most of which you'll never know, and you'll never be told the truth about. And you know, you can walk into a room and for one reason or another, someone won't like the cut of your jib. And you have to not take that personally. And if possible, even learn from it. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and not, internalize that and and take it as a deficiency of your own character or the way you look or anything like that so that's number one you've just got to try and remind yourself of that um in my opinion social media is the stuff of the devil for pretty much everybody if you ask me um i just i, I don't see a single good thing about it and and the whole thing of being able to keep in contact with people is vastly outweighed by how it attacks our self-esteem um so i don't do any of that uh, you know, I don't know. I, you know, I look at actors who do embrace social media and who do play the game in a way that I never have, probably to the detriment of my own career. Like, I don't particularly enjoy going to the parties. I, I, when I go to a premiere, I watch the first five minutes and then I'm gone. And it's not because I can't be bothered. It's because I can't take it. Right. Um, and I, I have to have a real line in the sound between my work is here uh, and my life is here. And, you know, I, I, I love my work, um, but, you know, contrary to what like X Factor philosophy would have you believe, it's not what I was born to do. It's not the center of my universe. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a compartment of my life that enables other compartments in my life, mm. um, which, well, that, you know, that's how I feel about it. And it, thankfully, thinking about it like that has enabled me to sort of maintain some sense of self and, and a sense of sanity. Because, mm. uh, you know, this, this business isn't fair. And any, any day, you're, you know, you're, 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 you may be, that there may be it for you. Yeah. You know, by no fault of necessarily your own. And living with that reality requires a certain amount of detachment. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's strange. I mean, uh, because almost everyone now is is almost voluntarily going through some of the things you have to go through as an actor, which is putting yourself out there and facing rejection for yeah. whatever reason. Uh, yeah. And and uh, but but taking it very much to heart because it's a judgment on the little thing that they've sort of presented to the world, which is only yeah. a few lines lo lines long sometimes. But everyone seems to be exposed to it in that sense. But yeah. it's good that you've drawn a line in the sand and gone, I'm just not doing it. Well, <laughs> yeah, I just, I, certain things don't make me happy at all. And I, I, and, yeah. and, and I absorb, I absorb that and, and fuck that for a game of soldiers. No way. Yeah. 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 For sure. Right. Last few things. Um, uh, what have you got coming up? I mean, I know things have been on, on pause, obviously, but um, is there anything you can tell us about that's been released or that you're going to be filming soon? Well, actually, no, I was just about to start in theatre, um, uh, doing a play at the Donmar about climate change. Uh, yeah. That was obviously cancelled or, or rather put on hold and that might start up. But, you know, I, the, the theatre is going to be the, one of the last things to come back because, I mean, I can't imagine a world anytime soon where 300, 400 people are willing to sit in a dark, hot, stuffy space with pensioners coughing for three hours at a time. Uh, yeah. So that'll take, take a minute. And, and film is starting to wind up. I, what, what, what we tend to be seeing is much larger productions, uh, like the new Tom Cruise Mission Impossible thing is starting to, yeah. to wind up. And, and they're figuring out how to do it safely. You right. know, insurance companies are figuring out how to do it and whether or not to sort of uh, isolate the, the entire production quarantine the entire production all these things are being figured out yeah. and the sort of the, the smaller productions will follow suit in time but at the minute there's just nothing happening yeah yeah but i'm all right with that little break it's okay yeah 
Have you yeah. been developing any new skills? I don't mean just in case. I mean, but no. <laughs> have you, uh, have you be been, you know, idea. brushing up on the cooking or, you know, gardening? Fitness? gardening. But uh, when I say gardening, I, I've got a terrace, uh, I don't know, <laughs> five square meters or something, but it's now completely covered in green. And yeah. I had no idea. I always look to my dad and he's always out in the garden and he loves that. It's his favorite thing. But boy, yeah. there's something to it. It really is. It's 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 an eye opening thing for me. It's it's I love it. It's my favourite, most peaceful time of the day going out and watering all all, all, all the plants. So that, that and and cycling. For me, yeah, you know, I, I'm one of those sort of guys you see in Lycra. Uh, yeah. but for me it's 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 the in terms of mental health, there is nothing better, in yeah. my opinion. Yeah. You you get out and, and you clear your mind and you exercise and you yeah. go fast and it's fun and then generally speaking for me if i go out in a bad mood i come back in a great one if i go out with a problem i come back with that problem solved yeah so i've been doing a few hours every day and you know yeah. is it a solo thing for you do you do it with mates cycling? solo solo yeah. Yeah. and i i go I, I i i use it to justify little trips mm. so I, I go off to spain or to france or you know austria and you know yeah. go up beautiful mountains it's just the best thing for me yeah 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 that's great um i've just got a vision of you and your dad gardening together now which is quite a hard to shake <laughs> no we, we haven't done it hasn't gone that far oh it hasn't no. No. okay <laughs> on the little allotment kind of thing yeah um what okay what um other than condor obviously what box sets have you been watching or what, any tv shows that you've been binging on I, do you know I just started again last night for the third time. I'm actually yeah. staying with my parents right now. Yeah. Uh, d don't fuck with cats. Oh, I haven't seen it. That's the you, one. <laughs> this moment right now is you getting the best tip of the week. <laughs> this, right. this is what happened. It's right. superb. Right. Superb. It's, yeah. uh, it's, it's about a group of internet sleuths, all of whom are fantastic characters that you, you couldn't have written. They're great characters. Yeah. Uh, tracking down a very, very active and, and, and uh, nasty psychopath. It's pretty, pretty good. That's great. Okay, good. Good tip. Yeah. Uh, oh, I wanted to ask you one thing um, about um, just speaking of just circling back slightly for a second. Yeah. Um, uh, getting ripped. Bodies, yeah. male bodies have, 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 have kind of been come up recently. I think Zac Efron has got some grief for having a, a, a dad bod, which he hasn't got. I'm a dad. I've got, I've got a dad bod. He hasn't. Hang on. Last time I saw Zac Efron, he was literally chiseled out of marble. Well, this is it. There was just one photo where he was not even, he was kind of, I think it was even just bad lighting or something like that. He wasn't by any stretch of the imagination, like had a porn or anything. But yeah. it brought a little bit of a debate around... You know, there's similar pressures now, perhaps for for actors to be pumped up on on set. I mean, you know, in in Condor, you're worked out, but did you feel really. were like compared a, bit to of, a, a little, I guess. Yeah, but it's the you know, do you have that pressure on screen now? Because everyone seems to be like massive. If you look at kind of the Robert Redford days, for instance, no one seemed yeah. bother. But is it something you have to be aware of, or is it just a, a you know? A, a personal fitness thing. You, you certainly have to be aware of it. Um, I'm not particularly good at this. Uh, yeah. I, and I've gone both ways. I've been too skinny. I've been too, too muscly. Yeah. Um, you, yeah, you do have to be aware of it. And, you know, the reality of it is if you're too far either way, yeah. uh, you, you eliminate your casting opportunities. So for right. me, the, the, the thing to do is to sort of sit in the middle, knowing that at two months notice, you could go either way if need be. Yeah, but but yeah, there is there is a lot of um, that sh that stuff around. But I, again, this this sort of to me goes back to like don't read your own reviews, don't go on the internet and Google yourself, don't spend too much time on social media examining what people think of you. Yeah, because uh, there's always going to be criticism, and you always hang on to the criticism. You never remember the compliments. Nice. Um, and also, I I I don't know if you'd agree with me, but I I'd say the actors who don't fixate on that and, and don't have the the massive pumped up bodies tend to have more interesting parts and more interesting careers generally. Yeah. Because sure. they reflect regular people. Mm. Um, you know, there's a couple of, yeah, I, I saw a film recently and w one of the Avengers is, is just playing a normal human and you could tell like his shirt is just his <laughs> shoulders and you just kind of don't buy it. 
you know. No, no, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, but going going to LA is funny. You know, occasionally you, uh, as an English actor who lives in London, you have to go out to LA and do the rounds, mm. and you you do, you know, you get looks. <laughs> You're a bit pasty. You stink of cigarettes. Your teeth are yellow. Why haven't you got muscles? You, are you seriously trying to be an actor? Because you don't look like you're seriously trying to be an actor. Um, but yeah. yeah. Look like right. a species. So it's those guys. Yeah. It's all right, it's villain, you know, always villains, it tends to be, you know, for the English. I remember I, um, I, I was in this awful film years ago called uh, Red Riding Hood, and I had to go out and do a chemistry test. And I, I thought it was just going to be three or four Brits that were being flown out for the chemistry test. But I got there and there were sure enough three or four Brits, but there were about 20 Americans. And we all had to sit in this room, waiting, taking turns to go in and, and do chemistry tests with Amanda Seyfried and another fella. And it was sort of love triangle stuff. So lots of, you know, chest pounding masculinity. Yeah. And the psychological warfare that was employed in that room was mad, mad. You've got yeah. guys taking their shirts off, you oh, know, God. doing press-ups with claps and then saying, you know, I, I hear they don't want uh, British people because they look vitamin deficient. <laughs> 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 wow. That would be a great rejection note, wouldn't it? Lack of vitamin D. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> go, go out and get some sun, you basement dweller. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Um, great. One final thing. Um, well, I'm going to ask you my final random questions. Best film ever made, without thinking about it. Alien. Yes. Oh, good choice. I'm pleased about that. That's I love it. my go-to's for sure. Really? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm to the point where my other half might actually leave me. I will whack <laughs> on like yeah. every week without fail. Yeah. Love it. I, I, I did have one that came to my head first, but I, hmm. I, I self-censored. But that's yeah. the hunt for Red October. Yes. It's a fucking great yeah, movie. That is, again, another quite claustrophobic, you know. Yeah, I, I, have, a, I have an interest in, in that stuff. I, I have a real fascination with the Cold War. Um, yeah. and, and I like films that are sort of isolated and suspenseful and, and mm -hmm. otherworldly and submarines and spaces. But they're, they're quite good. So those two films are my favourite. Yeah. Alien. Why Alien? I ask. Oh, so many reasons. Um, I just think Ridley Scott and also uh, what's his name in the set in Aliens they just they I don't know how they do it they give you a sense of the broader universe that yeah. they're the story's being told in mm. the values and the and the and just the sense of it they really draw that well um, and also you don't you know in the first movie you hardly see the alien uh, I don't know I just think it's it's, it's it's a fucking great movie, and it makes us look out to the to the sky not so much with wonder, but also with a bit of fear. And I don't know, it, it talks to something inside me. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, just one, one final thing. Sorry, I know I'm taking too long, but no, it's all right. Um, uh, Condor. Why should people watch Condor? God, uh, because I think it asks very valuable questions of its audience. Um, but on top of that. It's fun, it's fast. Uh, we've got fantastic actors. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. That's enough. That's plenty. I'm crap at that sort of thing. <laughs> Sorry for putting you on the spotlight, man. That was annoying. No, 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 not at all. There you go.